to the sports angle. Live in Las Vegas, the entertainment capital of the world. I'm your host, Rocco Kelly. Let's get into it. We're here with Andre Robinson from the Rise Up family. Welcome back to the show. What's up? What's up? You know what it is. Unity, unity, baby. Let's get it. The Green Bay Packers, last two years, NFC Championship game, NFC Championship game. They're normally among the odds-on favorite to go to the Super Bowl, always, you know, in the top five, according to the odds makers here in Las Vegas. I've dominated the NFC North year after year after year. But let me ask you, from a Packers fan perspective, do you believe that their Super Bowl window is still alive? Or are they just going to be a playoff contender and not a Super Bowl contender? Because we know from watching enough NFL that there's a difference between being a playoff contender and being a Super Bowl contender. So I see you already wanted to start off the sports angle with me fire starting um, with this topic. But uh, nevertheless, I will say that the organization is making it really hard to believe that the window is still open. The organization, their moves, the things that they do, um, the mistakes that they've made, um, you know, the scrutiny that they've put on players. Um, I mean, they've distracted their own organization at times uh, with a lot of the nonsense uh, that you've heard. Um, so, at a, so Aaron Jones right now is a free agent, as we know. But I do have an idea, even if Aaron Jones was to leave. Uh, we saw in, in spurts last season that A.J. Dillon could run the ball. Um, there is a certain free agent that is out right now um, out of Detroit that if you really wanted to pay, if you really wanted to Okay. Where he's going to win. Um, Aaron Rodgers is obviously one of the best quarterbacks in the league, so he would be playing with uh, someone who is a better thrower of the football. Um, Jared Goff is not going to get it done in Detroit, I don't think. Uh, we had this conversation at nauseum about him um, going to Detroit, things of that nature. Um, and if Green Bay can actually make the moves on defense that they need to, like restructuring contracts, things of that nature, um, it's not a miss that they could get to the Super Bowl. Uh, but the organization, again, it, it you would have to entrust your heart on the organization actually making these splash moves. So as it sounds good that I'm talking about it, it's just as bad as it sounds because they never do it. You see what I'm saying? So I would say, I would say for most fanatics that are Packers fanatics, I'm not shocked if they think the window is closed. Yeah, we're talking about the Green Bay Packers here on the Sports Angle. I'm your host, Rocco Kelly. We're here with Andre Robinson from the Rise Up family. Here is my argument, and I have said this on this show time and time again. How much confidence does Aaron Rodgers really have in the organization? How much trust does he have for them to get the job done? Because he's been there for 15 years, and he's had only one Super Bowl appearance. He's been there 15 years, only has that one ring. And as much as people don't like to talk about how important a legacy is to a quarterback, we know that Aaron Rodgers is looking at Canton and going, all right, I know I'm in the Hall of Fame, but where am I on that level, on that scale of the all-time greats? That's got to be in his mind. So, 
when it comes to Aaron Rodgers, and we saw what happened after the Tampa Bay loss, all of the speculation, the rumors about him leaving Green Bay, do you think that Aaron Rodgers, could you picture him walking in to a front office and saying, look, I have no confidence in you guys helping me. I have no trust in you guys getting me the pieces I need to win, trade me to a team that can actually get me a championship. Could you see that happening? Um, yeah, I could see that happening, but I think I think honestly that's from a more upper upper management point of view. Um, if we look at if we look at what Matt LaFleur has done in the last two seasons, he's, I mean, 13 and three back to back, two back to back NFC championship appearances. I mean, can you really, can you really get upset um, with Matt LaFleur in this situation as far as I know he's the one who decided to, you know, the field goal instead of going forward on fourth down in the uh, NFC championship game. But do you really blame uh, Matt LaFleur for for the distrust, or do you blame more of Brian uh, Brian G and the upper management as far as the moves that they've made? And me, personally, I would blame them. What Matt LaFleur has done as a coach the first two years is nothing short of phenomenal especially coming from a place in Tennessee where he was 20th uh, in offense, and it took him a whole season to figure out that Derrick Henry was their best weapon. He comes to Green Bay, and he makes it easier for Aaron Rodgers. Last year, Aaron Rodgers had a lot of fun playing, a lot of fun. You can tell the difference between the first year when they got beat by the 49ers in the uh, NFC Championship game to – this year when they got beat by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the NFC Championship game, the aura was different. The the um, the environment was different. You could tell that Aaron was enjoying what he was doing. So for folks who say that that Aaron would go in there, I think it would be on the upper management stage. It wouldn't uh, – perspective, it wouldn't really be on Matt LaFleur as per se. I think, honestly, and this is going to sound crazy to some folks, but I think Matt LaFleur needs more um, power as far as um, general management. Uh, rest in peace to Ted Thompson, but he didn't really do us a great service um, those first couple years, you know, with Aaron Rodgers, well, the first 10 years. Uh, Aaron Rodgers as the quarterback. I think he squandered a lot of his great years playing around with the development, um, with the draft and development system. Uh, and now Brian G, I feel like, again, tried to follow in Ted Thompson's footsteps with the Jordan Love situation, um, with the A.J. Dillon, which I actually think A.J. Dillon is not such a bad pick now uh, that you're letting Aaron Jones off the hook, but the Jordan Love pick was, I think you could have waited on that. That that pick is the pick that everybody's going to be like, well, you know, you could have added something to that team that would have got him over the hump, but you decided to pick a guy who's nowhere near ready to play NFL football. And as we're talking about the Green Bay Packers here on the Sports Angle, I am your host, Rocco Kelly. We have Andre Robinson from the Rise Up family. I understand that the Packers and Matt LaFleur, I mean, he is a really good head coach. I'm not going to deny that. I'm also not going to deny that Chicago, Minnesota, Detroit, they're not on that level of Green Bay. And I want to clarify this for the people who are watching. I'm not saying that Green Bay isn't going to win the division. I'm not saying that they aren't going to just dominate the NFC North for what it feels like the 600th time in a row. What I'm saying to you is when it comes to Green Bay, I believe that their window of winning a Super Bowl is coming to an end. 
I don't think that them making the playoffs is over, but I'm saying that them being a Super Bowl favorite is done because of the fact that Aaron Rodgers year after year is like, hey, can you please get me some help? And it seems like Green Bay has just looked at him like, nah, we're just going to draft a quarterback in the first round. Nah, we're just going to go draft another running back. Like, it seems like Green Bay in the draft, I I said this before, it feels like the Packers just draft the best available, regardless of the need. Like, it just feels like they just look at the draft board and go, oh, he's on top of the board, great, we'll draft him. But, sir, we already have this many running backs. Don't matter. We're going to draft them. And I'm glad you brought up the Jordan Love uh, situation because I want to point out that the Green Bay Packers, they needed to go get wide receivers. There has been those times where the offensive line hasn't been the best. It's gotten better, but it hasn't been the best. So with the Packers not addressing those needs, do you think that they'll actually do that this year? Or do you think it will be the same song and dance that they've had for the last seven years, which is not really helping Aaron Rodgers when he needs it the most? So so let me be clear about something for, for those who, who talk about offensive weapons. I, I, I say offensive weapons. The reason why a lot of people say offensive weapons is because just look at the, the team that just won the Super Bowl. Look at the teams who are who are super successful. These guys are starting to do and <laughs> I don't want to make I don't want to make basketball and football synonymous in this in this argument or this conversation, but I have to. Uh the LeBron James esque moves that, that teams are doing. LeBron James is influential too. I'm starting to see he's very influential. The player created super teams that we see. Now, if you look at the yeah, 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 if, if the empowerment era. Um, if you look at Tampa Bay's team last year, Leonard Fournette, Tom Brady, Ronald Jones, you got Antonio Brown, you got Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, Scotty Miller, uh, Gronkowski, Cameron Bray. I mean, those are just a bunch to name, like just on offense alone. Hmm. Then you have on defense, you had Levon David, Shaq Barrett. Uh, Devin White, uh, Indama Kasu, JPP, Vita Vea, Antoine Winfield. Winfield yeah. Like, come on, man. Like, that's a you not that's a super that's a super team, folks. For for those who think, and I just and I don't want to get off on a tangent, but for those who think that Brady winning in Tampa Bay proved that he's better than Belichick, stop it. Cut it out. Please stop that. Don't start. That narrative is excessive and stretched by the the greatest of imagination. Okay. So getting back to Aaron Rodgers, I think Aaron Rodgers needs those offensive pieces. Like you need more to get over the hump because there's teams like Tampa Bay who are doing this. You see what I'm saying? And it's working to their benefit. Um, Aaron Rodgers has Devontae Adams, Aaron Jones. He made um he made the tight end Robert Tyen look good. You understand what I'm saying? He made him look good. Right, right. But you need more than that. You need more than that. You understand what I'm saying? You need more than that. That's not enough to win a Super Bowl on offense. And I really – and I want to put this out there too. Let's remember that Green Bay also with Aaron Rodgers and uh, Devontae Adams, who has been missing two, two, three seasons in a row now, a couple games here and there. Um, still was number one in offensive points per game. Like, they still were number one offensive points per game. So as far as the offensive thing is, is, is uh, per se, yeah, he could use more pieces. But let's be clear that the offense was number, number one in points in, 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 in what they do this year as well. All right. Um, there's reports right now that uh, Devin Funches has restructured this contract to stay on Green Bay after he opted out last year, which I think would have been a viable piece, even though he's not the greatest. We call him moldy pineapple functions for a reason. Um, but he's restructured. So I told you in the beginning, it, it sounded like it would be a good move if they went and got Kenny Galladay. I don't think Green Bay really should make moves on the offensive end. I think their moves need to come at the defensive end. 
uh, just like last year. I really think in the first round they should have got a defensive uh, defensive lineman. I do not trust Lancaster to push any pocket whatsoever, to get pressure on any pocket whatsoever. Um, Clark is here and there. Okay? He's, you ever heard the song, Here and Now? Right? You ever heard that that old classic song? Okay. Right. Yeah. That's that's Kenny Clark for you. And then you got the Smith brothers. The Smith brothers is, you know, they do their thing. If it ain't the Smith brothers, you really ain't getting much from that defensive line. And from what I'm just hearing, um, Preston Smith may be, may be trade bait. Now, they might be trading him. Right. You got to get some defensive pieces. Tampa Bay just showed you just showed you what to do. They stacked on defense. Their their linebacking core is one of the best in football. I mean, JPP has never lost a playoff game. <laughs> Let's be clear. Dominguez who goes to this team with Via Vea and um and it's like, yeah, you know, I got a Super Bowl ring. Now you can talk about all the fame. Now, now we can jiggle that around. You know what I mean? But the Packers have to do that on defense to me in order to get to the Super Bowl. I don't think it's an offensive thing now. I think it's more of a defensive thing. Would offensive pieces be good? Sure. But the defense is what they need to shore up. Andre Robinson from the Rise Up family. Now, in the NFL, now in the NFL, in college football, there are a type of coach that I call the motivator. They're the one that brings out the best, the 120% of their athletes. And I'm not just talking about academically. I'm not just talking about athletically. I'm talking about as a person. They bring out the absolute best and the people that are with them. Now, when it comes to that, in your mind, what's the first coach that pops into your head that is a motivator inside and out? Well, Bill Belichick's off that list now that you say motivator and how to act off the field. Um, Bill Belichick's off that list. Um, wow. Wow. I would I would have said Mike Tomlin before all that stuff uh, that occurred last year, uh, because we know Mike Tomlin is more of a motivator of men than he is an X and O's guy as far as being a coach. Uh, wow! <laughs> whoa, whoa. Um, can this be in any genre of sports, or does this have to be NFL? Well, I was going to do uh, NFL and college football, but if you have a one off the top of your head, another sport. Give it. Um, I will be very honest. I think Greg Popovich is one. He's a motivator. Right. He is uh, uh, the motivational guy. And a lot of people will say, well, he hasn't won a championship since Tim Duncan. But 
what I will say is that he does get the best out of his guys. Uh, he definitely promotes that, empowers uh, people uh, to be the best. Now, there's a difference between having talent on the team and coaching talent. I want folks to understand that. So when when you see talent out there being successful, I don't want you to necessarily think that it's because the coach is, is, is jumping, uh, jumping to make that happen. Sometimes talent trumps a lot of things. And there's a lot of coaches that sit with a lot of talent who aren't the greatest of motivators, though. Um, so with that being said, if that narrows down your choice, I hope it does because I don't want people to think that uh, that coaching is easy. Coaching is not easy at, from, no, from not. the coach said itself. Um, I don't want to put – I don't want to tap my own back, but if we were talking about coaches who get the best out of people and motivate people, uh, I would say – I would say me from, from the coaching standpoint where I coach, but um, we won't get into that, by the way. We got practice next week, so we got to go to work. We got work to do uh, starting next week. But Mike Tomlin is one of those guys. We're talking college football. Uh, Dabo Sweeney is, a, is one of those guys. Dabo gets the best out of his out of his people. I mean, he went to Clemson and turned Clemson around, like totally around. Um, if we're talking college basketball, we're talking college basketball. <laughs> Baylor's coach is actually a motivant. Baylor. Think about Baylor. Absolutely. Just, just for a second. Baylor had won a conference championship in 71 years, dated back to 1950. Okay. Comes in two, three years, and this guy has not only turned Baylor's men's basketball, which in which Baylor's women's basketball at one point was getting way more uh, attention and prop. Uh, than men's basketball. But this guy, um, Scotty, uh, and I forget his last name. I think it's Scotty Wilson. I don't think Wilson is his last name. But um, he has come in and done the same thing to me that Matt LaFleur has, but has put them in position to, um, in the same token, win. Uh, I mean, Baylor could be your next NCAA champion. I know they got a tournament coming up, and we'll see what they do in the tournament. But I've seen the resiliency of this Baylor team. So I would go with him in college basketball just for what he's done. I mean, it's not easy to turn a program in three years at all. Not easy, let alone one. I mean, I'll um, say this. Um, as we're talking about motivators, talking about you know head coaches that motivate their players, motivate their talent, in sports, I'm your host, Rocco or Kelly. We're here with Andre Robinson from the Rise of Family. Now, who I believe it is, I'm going to give an historical example, and then I'm going to give a modern day. Because in the NFL, I think Bill Walsh would be an immediate guy on that list when it oh, came yeah. to bringing out the best, uh, uh, best out of the, the talent. Bill Walsh was definitely that. And a guy very underrated is Mike Shanahan. Mike, Shan Mike Shanahan, when he was with Denver, with the Raiders, he brought out the best in his guys. Now, the modern era, now this is going to get a lot of people upset, a lot of people angry, but hear me out on this. I think Kyle Shanahan learned a lot from his dad. And I've heard a lot of people in San Francisco say that he brings out the best of his guys. He did it in Atlanta. He did it in Cleveland. He's done it in Houston. Like, I believe Kyle Shanahan is very similar to his dad when it comes to motivating the players underneath him, the players that play alongside him. And then the second one, I got to go with Pete Carroll. And I know Pete Carroll the last five years has been on a downward swing. But if you saw what he did at USC, did at Seattle the first couple of years he was there, he motivated the heck out of him. So that's what my example would be. Pete Carroll and uh, Kyle Shanahan in the modern era, but Mike Shanahan and Bill Walsh in the past. But what do you think? Um, I like I like the uh, Mike Shanahan, Bill Walsh, um, Kyle Shanahan. I'm I'm okay with Kyle Shanahan. Uh, another guy who can get you to a certain level. I don't know if he gets you over the hump, but uh, get you to a certain level. 
and then uh, Pete Carroll. Obviously, Pete Carroll um, is a big motivator, uh, a guy who sets a tone um, in a locker room or who was known for setting a tone in the locker room. Obviously, you had the Legion of Boom, so, you know, it was something he was set in that locker room that had them uh, with the with the attitude that they had when they played. You like those sea chickens, huh? <laughs> <laughs> nah, they're all right. They're, they're okay. Um, I think everybody has an expiration date, though. This is my thing. If we're going to talk about uh, motivators, let's talk about Bill Parcells. Bill Parcells in the past, obviously, he would come to your organization, fix your organization, and leave. Well, Bill Polian's another one. Bill Polian, from an executive standpoint, he'd come to your organization, fix something, and, and then leave. Mm-hmm. I think every I think every coach at some point in time has an expiration date. And I'm not talking about uh, your retirement date. I'm talking about an expiration date on things that they do best just because uh, with everything comes an end to something. There's always an end to something. So uh, I like I like your picks. I do. I like your picks. And I hope you like mine because I added I added Bill Parcells. Of course. Things of that nature. So. Yeah. And then for college football, I know you brought up Dabo Sweeney. I'm going to give you one that's kind of historical. Like, I know he doesn't coach now, but he was a coach a couple of years ago. What about Chris Peterson? Well, he was at Boise State in Washington. I think he motivated a lot of the guys that, he, that coached with him. Uh, I, I do like I do like that pick. In fact, I feel like Boise State may have been robbed a couple of times of national championship recognition uh, to even be able to have an opportunity to play in those national championships. I think uh, – they were robbed uh, just because of the division that they're in. I will say this too. I hope and pray that that is something that they fix coming up. Maybe that would be a topic for another day. Um, the NCAA or, or any sport for that matter that has the moniker that says, well, if you play in this division, you should have more of a chance to do this than other divisions. Um, my problem is, is that it's a little prejudicial because every team can't be in every every division. So, are we just eliminating teams from from opportunities because of that? Like, it would be different if they if. If it was like, oh, okay, you know what, they had their opportunity and this, and they just, you know. But for teams like Boise State, uh, we've seen other teams in the past. What's the other one? Uh, TCU, uh, things in that na- nature back in the day, who mm-hmm. I feel should have had an opportunity to, to play in a national championship. If you conquer and destroy your division, you should have an opportunity for a national title. Now, they came up with the playoff system to kind of smokescreen that, where they put four teams in. But the four teams that they put in are still of the Power Five Conference. Well, I can tell you why. I mean, I can tell everyone who's listening right now why. It's about money. It's about TV ratings. It's about all yeah, of that. I hate that, though. You gotta, like, they got to stop that. They got to stop that. I get it. It's about money. It's about TV ratings. But it also has to be about opportunity. If I'm a guy who who works, in, and I will tell you, as an athlete, it is hard as hell to train day in, day out, year in, year out, to be sitting up here playing with no opportunity. It's almost like playing JV basketball. JV basketball doesn't have a playoff in Western New York. So most JV people feel like, oh, what are we playing for? Record, like we're not playing at a chance at a title. And I feel that's kind of the same way in, in, in CAA. Um, if I'm in a MAC conference, I will never get to play for a national title. If I'm in the WAC, American. right, if I'm in the WAC conference, I never get the chance to play for a national title. Why? Because of money, 
because of uh, politics. And I think that's kind of got to, I think you kind of got to get away from that. And I get it, it kind of be higher than football because football is such a physical sport to have a tournament of 64. Well, you- well, I've always said this, and a lot of people on this show actually agree with me on this. How about you do kind of the similar tournament to what Division Two does or what Division One FCS does? For anybody who watches those games, you will know that they'll take the top eight and they'll go 1v8, 2v7, 3v6, and they do kind of a knockout style. But the way they do it is that it's not by a computer. It's not by all of this crap that the college football playoff committee has. No, what, who the eight teams that have the best record in terms of win-loss, they get into that bracket. I mean, it would be a really that. good scenario for college football. Yeah, I could respect that. I could respect that. That's something I could respect because it still gives other people an opportunity and a chance. How many times have you seen Penn State? Or the, no, see, we can go here. How many times have you seen Penn State with a chance for the national title? Lately, we've seen Notre Dame sneak. We've seen Notre Dame sneak in and get in, right? But how many times have you seen the Penn States of the world? How many times have you seen, uh, wow, the, the well, Well, I mean, hey, hey let me time. give you this. I mean, we just saw this past year a certain Ohio State team play less games than anybody else, and yet they made the tournament. They made the college football playoff. And I always told people that made absolutely no sense unless you look at the sports books, and I think they were the second to best odds. That's the only explanation for it. Understand that the sports books have so much weight. The people who are the TV networks have so much weight. Like, the college football playoff keeps on using this computer rankings, like, you know, weighted schedule. And I'm like, you only use that when it benefits you. Like, we've seen in the past that teams actually have a worse rating than a team behind them. But then the argument is, oh, they actually beat this team. And I'm like, now wait a minute. If they have a worse ranking, then why does it matter that the team ahead of them beat a team that is in a different conference? It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's about prior pri- <clears throat> pri- <clears throat> I don't know how to say that word. It's Are about choosing. It's about choosing what teams get in and what teams get out because of pref- uh, preferential treatment. That's what it is. It's about what preference you got. Right. Prioritizing which teams get in and, and personal preference. We've been talking about NBA, college basketball. We talked about all of this. We're going to segue because the NFL Pro Bowl, it's been around for decades. And there are people that have even said that the NFL Pro Bowl isn't working anymore. Like, obviously, the players really don't care. The coaches are there, but you can really tell that they really don't want to be there. It seems like no one genuinely doesn't want it. They don't want to be there. The money, 
Yeah, there's there's really not that much money that can motivate and incentivize the players that are going to be there. So I have an idea. And here on the sports angle, here's what my angle is. How about you replace the NFL Pro Bowl with what the NHL does? Why don't you replace the NFL Pro Bowl with what the NBA has done, which is you pick uh, you pick two teams, and you have one team be led by a certain player, you have one team be led by a certain player, and you pretty much have them pick their roster, and that's pretty much the way you do it. Because the NBA All-Star Game, as much as we, like people say they don't care about it, they get ratings. They get people who watch. And the NFL Pro Bowl really hasn't. So what do you think about that? Having it kind of be similar to the NBA, where you have it in a pick format. I thought the NFL tried that when they had Deion Sanders and Jerry Rice um, with teams. Well, they tried it with legends. I'm saying that you have two active players be the captains. Yeah, I can, I can, um, I can, I could go for that. I think that would be that would be more exciting. But I think with with the Pro Bowl, the spirit of competition is missing. I think the incentive is missing. I think if you add an incentive to it, it would be more interesting for the players to want to play in a Pro Bowl. Now, what that incentive is, you'd have to think about that. Uh, because obviously, you know, the NFL picks where the Super Bowl goes. So, we really can't use that incentive. Uh, the number one pick, the pick, the draft picks are by win-loss record. So, you really can't use that as a, you know, can't use that as an incentive. Right. But you would have to decipher what incentive would be um, feasible or what what incentive would motivate these folks to actually want to play and it not just be a vacation because right now the Pro Bowl is just a vacation. All right. So as we're talking about ideas of changing the Pro Bowl with the NFL, how about if anyone who watches the NHL, they'll know immediately where I'm going with this. The NHL does it by division. They have, you know, all-stars from the Metro, all-stars from the Atlantic, from the Central, from the Pacific. So what if the NFL did that type of all-star game format where you have, you know, your offensive players from the East, the North, the South, the West, and you have that type of all-star game? Because you could have four separate teams, but it would be the best of the East, best of the North, best of the South, and best of the West, and you have them compete in a kind of style format we've never seen before. What about that? That's it's more interesting than a vacation. So, so yes, that that to me is a good idea. It's more interesting than just a vacation. Now, what's on the line though? That's the thing. You gotta. What's on the line? You know what? The NBA did something interesting this year. They had charity work. The HBCU thing. I think if the NFL did something like that, I think it would be more interesting for them to play. We talked about incentive base, talk about something to actually play for. I think that the NFL and all this money that they get and all these money, all this money that these owners get, the whole nine yards, I think it would be great for them to play like a style like that. And the money goes to a HBCU or the money goes to a, to an organization of uh, charity, uh, things of that nature. I think that would be more, you know, fun to play for. All right. And then there's also been discussion as we're talking about the NFL possibly changing the Pro Bowl here on the Sports Angle. I'm your host, Rocco Kelly. We're here with Andre Robinson from the Rise Up Family. There's also been talk about just getting rid of it entirely. There has been discussion that we could just get rid of the Pro Bowl and just have the all-pro selections be what matters. And I've said, in theory, I understand. But at the same time, I think the Pro Bowl has like eight quarterbacks get selected. Whereas the All-Pro, you only have two. Or maybe even a trio. So what do you think about the possibility of them getting rid of it entirely 
and just having the all pro selections be what what decides it at the end of the day. Well, I think that's an option, especially if you can't get it to go over. <laughs> if you can't get the Pro Bowl to get, go over, sometimes you got to pack it up and then come back to it when uh, you have a legit plan for it. Uh, it may have to happen. It may happen. It may it may happen. Um, that's not a that's not a like idea that that couldn't happen. That's not a, like it's not a possibility. No, it's a possibility to me. Um, because again, the Pro Bowl is a vacation, and it's boring. Nobody watches it. I would watch. I would rather watch a WWE pay per view than to watch than to watch the Pro Bowl. You know what? I like that. Hey, here's what we're going to do. We are going to go to break here on the Sports Angle. We're actually going to be talking about our MLB discussion, talking about the National League East. We've been talking about the MLB on Thursday, Friday, Monday, and all this entire week. So when we come back from break, I will talk about MLB, talk about the National League East, and we will be right back here on the Sports Angle. Don't go anywhere. Can't wait. here with Andre Robinson from the Rise Up family. Now, this past couple of days here on the Sports Angle, last week we did the NL Central, we did the AL Central. Last yesterday's show, we talked about the AL East. Today we're going to talk about the NL East. I'm going to start out with Atlanta. I know there's a lot of Braves fans out there in the world, there's a lot of people who represent ATL. And you know what? The Braves have been on the come up. They've been on the rise the last couple of years. And they are 9-1 to one, odds on favorite to win the World Series, one of the top dogs. The pro for that team is their young core. Oku uh, Ronald Acuna Jr., Ozzy Albies, uh, Dansby Swanson. There is a good amount of talent. Austin Riley. There is this core that they have built. The con however, for the Atlanta Braves have been that starting pitching. They've been injury prone. They've had problems keeping them on the field. They even had to send uh, Mike Fultowinitz down to AAA. So understand that the Atlanta Braves, if their starting pitching doesn't improve, if they don't get guys at the MLB trade deadline, then I say that it's going to be tough for them to compete for a World Series title. You can have your starting lineup be solid, but if you don't have starting pitching, it's not going to matter. You, you added Charlie Morton, that's a nice step, but I feel like you need to add more. Andre, what do you think about the Atlanta Braves? 9-1, to one, 
odds to win the World Series. Uh, I mean, right now, when it comes to the Atlanta Braves, they don't really have announced who is their closer, what their bullpen's going to be. That's also a sketchy situation as well. So, under. Hey, Andre, uh, we cannot hear you, bud. I'm sorry. I was asking about the Braves' closer. I, I, my my apologies. Um, who's the closer for the Braves? I already heard that Drew Smithley is already struggling in pre, uh, in spring uh, in spring tryouts in 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 uh, against the Pirates just recently. I heard I heard there was some uh, some struggles. Well, well, to answer the question, I mean they have Luke Jackson in their bullpen. They have AJ Minter in their bullpen which are nice alongside with Will Smith. But as of right now, they haven't announced who is their closer yet. Who Who's this guy, uh, Max Freed, that's starting? Max Freed, he's supposed to be this really young guy, this up-and-coming player for the Atlanta Braves. And he does have talent. He definitely does. But you have him, you have Morton, you have Anderson, and you're building on that young core. But my problem with the Brave is that they've had injury concerns with that starting ro uh, rotation. So until they get those injury problems resolved, I don't know if I can confidently say that they're going to be the top dog in the National League. I'm, I'm going to go back to the splash conversation again. Who's a splash on their team as far as starting pitching? Who is a splash? Because we know that pitching is important. Who's a splash on their on their team? Outside of Max Fareed and Charlie Morton, I probably would say no, nobody else. Those are really the nobody top else. two. No Chris Martin. No Chris Kyle Martin's Mullen. solid. I'll give him that. Yeah, he, right. he's solid. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but with, that's with the Atlanta Braves. So as we're talking about the National League East here on the Sports Angle, I'm your host, Rocco Kelly. We're with Andre Robinson from the Rise Up family. So like I mentioned, their pro is their core. They've kept that together. Their building is consistent, but their con is their pitching. Now we're going to move on from the Atlanta Braves over to the Miami Marlins. Their pro is they could build off the momentum from 2020. They were a surprise team. They made it to the playoffs. And it seemed like Don Mattingly had been building somewhat of a culture in Miami. Now, my con for Miami is that there is no definitive star in Miami. They don't have a John, John Carlos Stanton. They don't have a Christian Yelich, Lorenzo Cain, Jose Fernandez, RIP. They don't really have those guys in Miami. You, maybe you can say Anderson, but even that is a stretch. So with Miami, the con is they don't have enough depth on that roster, I believe, to really be a playoff team in 162 games. Because let's remind everybody now, this isn't a 60-game season. This isn't a little jog. This is a marathon. This is a long stretch of road that this season is going to go down. So I believe that they're not going to be absolutely awful 100 loss season, but I don't think that they have enough talent to be a top dog in the NL East for 162 games. Andre, what do you think? I think the Miami Marlins uh, are in rebuild mode again. I don't see the Miami Marlins doing anything. In fact, I see them being right where they're going to be, which is last place. In the division. <laughs> and with Sorry. them being 80 to 1 odds, that actually would back up your point. They are the lowest out of all the NL East teams, according to the odds makers, according to the sports books here in Las Vegas. They do have some talent, though, on the rise, though. I mean, Starlin Marte, Brian Anderson, Adam Duvall, they have some talent. But I agree, it's, this is just not their year. So as we're talking about the National League East, 
here on the Sports Angle. I'm your host, Rocco Kelly. We're here with Andre Robinson from the Rise Up family. Now let's get into the team that I personally think has the most potential in the National League East, and that is the New York Mets. I mean, they have made splash after splash after splash. I feel like Chris move right now. Like, they're just making splash moves right now. So, at them being 12-1 to 1 with the New York Mets, the pro is that they have depth on top of depth on top of depth. Their infield is solid. Their outfield is solid. A good catcher on the backstop. Their starting rotation, in my opinion, the second best in all of baseball. The con is their bullpen. The con is that their bullpen could cost them games late in the season. Edwin Diaz was good in Seattle. With the Mets, he looks like he's cracking under pressure. So with the Mets organization, I say that Steve Cohen and the general manager fixes the bullpen at the trade deadline, this team could be one of the best to watch out for in MLB in 2021. And with them being 12 to 1 odds, clearly the sports books agree that they have a good shot of winning the World Series. Andre, what do you think about the New York Mets? I mean, they kind of are in your backyard after all. So I'm talking about the Mets. Didn't Jose Martinez just have a freak accident? You want to talk about injuries? The Mets have always had injury problems. That is correct. Yes. Lord Jesus. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Um, yeah, you're right about that. Again, the bullpen has to has to come out and play. Uh, David Peterson uh, made a, a early case for the rotational spot. Obviously, um, we had we had a, another pitcher who just recently uh, was pitching Walker. I, I don't know his first name. I'm not even gonna lie to you guys. Hey, John um, Walker. Yes, thank you. Um, who who had an impressive uh, showing. Um, again, Mr. Chris Move, we talk about Splash. Splash. Right? Yeah. Uh, where, is it? where is it on this bullpen? Where's the Splash? Well, they're going to have to go people? and make a trade. They're going to have to go get somebody. Yeah, you got it. <sighs> You can have all the pieces in the world, but if your pitching is is not up to par, your offense is gonna have trouble. Your offense is gonna have to put up six, seven runs a game to win to win baseball games. How how long can you do that in a season that has 162 games, or is it less this year? No, they said that they're trying to do the full season this year. They're gonna right. try to. So limit, yeah. limit. Yep. Go ahead. No, like what I was going to say was is that the MLB trade deadline in July, we normally see that the weaknesses try to be corrected, and the bullpen is the weakness in New York. But, man, I think they got a lot of potential, a lot of talent in New York. Yeah, I hope New York can actually put it together. Got to put it together. Now, to do one of the worst segues in my entire life, now we're going to go from the Queen – all the way to the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Let's go talk about the Philadelphia Phillies because their biggest pro is that they have Bryce Harper. Bryce Harper is a superstar. He is a generational-type talent. The con is that they have Bryce Harper. He is a pro and a con at the same time because his contract is the main reason why the Phillies really haven't made a lot of moves. Uh, Zach Wheeler contract kind of looks like it's seeming to backfire on them just a bit in Philadelphia. They don't have a lot of talent around that roster. They have two guys. That seems to be about it. So with Philadelphia, I'm not going to be surprised if they finish towards the bottom of the division. You know, if they're around the Miami tier of the NL East, and the odds makers seem to agree as well, 35 to 1 odds to win the World Series. With Philadelphia, do you agree or disagree that Philadelphia is going to have a really hard time getting to the playoffs, let alone a World Series title? Well, first and foremost, I want to say, I want to say rest in peace to uh, Riel Cormier, who just died recently from uh, the 
uh, ex reliever for the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, of course. Rest in peace, all right. Uh, with that being said, your question is, do the Phillies have enough to get to where they need to? Uh, you got JT uh, Romito. Uh, yeah, Real Muto. Yeah. Real Muto, I'm sorry. Uh, excuse my linguistic skills on, on enunciating these guys' names. Um, uh, you got DD. Uh, you got DD at the shortstop still. Okay. I mean, you so got... You Right, I mean, you've got, you know, Hoskins, you got Segura. You, I mean, you have this talent in Philadelphia, but I don't think it's enough. Um, do they have Andrew McCutcheon still? They have him at left field, yeah, alongside Harper. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to say the Phillies are going to be, like, second, third place, third place in the division. I'll give them third place in the division, only because the NL East is about as, as weak as uh, the NFC East division <laughs> in, in football. Um, I think it's a weak division. I ain't gonna lie. I think it's a weak division. I think the Mets can be number one, or the on the Braves could be number one, and then you can put the Mets at number two, Phillies at three, and then everything else will fall in place. I think, uh, like I said, the Marlins are last. So, as we've been talking about the NL East here on the Sports Angle, I'm your host Rocco Kelly. We have Andre Robinson from the Rise Up Family. Now. You've given your prediction, and I will give my prediction after we talk about the last team on this list, and that is the most recent World Series champion to come from this division, and that is the Washington Nationals. And right now they are 40 to 1 to win the World Series. The Ooh, pro for I, them. I, I totally forgot about that. Why did I forget about the Nationals? How did I forget? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that changes everything to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Washington Nationals, the biggest pro for them is that they have a lot of talent from that 2018 World Series roster. You have is Juan Soto. Oh, they have they have really good pitching. They added John Lester. Cool. They've added, you know, uh, Patrick Corbin. They still have Steven Strasburg. They still have Max Scherzer. They do have solid pitching. So the pro is they still have that talent from the 2018 roster, Juan Soto, Victor Robles, Trey Turner. They do have those guys. The con is their bullpen. Their bullpen has kind of always been a weak spot for Washington over the last couple of years, and I don't expect that to change. Now, Washington could be a playoff team, but I don't know if they would be a World Series contender going up against the rest of the National League. So with the Washington Nationals, them adding John Lester, them adding Josh Bell, Kyle Schwarber in the offseason, do you think that they have a chance of going back to the World Series, or could they just be a playoff contender at best? Wait a minute. I'm sorry. The Nationals are going to win the division. The Braves will fight with the Nationals. The Mets will fight. That will be a three-way fight. Um, I, I can see one, two, three down the line. The Phillies will be four and then the Marlins will be five. I'm so sorry that I forgot about the Nationals. I'm going to sit here and forget about Matt Scherzer. I'm going to forget about uh, Steven Strasburg. Is there, are they still pitchers on that team? Oh, they're, they're still, still there. I mean, they're they 40. Anthony Rendon. They still have Anthony Rendon. Uh, he signed yeah. with the Angels, but they did get Ryan Zimmerman back, and he's Mr. Okay, National. For they week. got Zimmerman, right? They did get they Zimmerman, have, right? Yep. Oh, yeah, and then you add John Lester to that bullpen. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man, you're giving me a headache. Oh, I'm getting a headache. <laughs> Thinking about the team now. What? I mean, these guys, these guys are strad. Patrick Corbin, Brian Dozer. Then you got Adam Eaton. You got uh, you got Matt uh, You got Matt Adams. And I'm hearing that they got a center field, a fielder that might be one of the best defensive play, uh, players in the, in, in, in the game and can hit for power. Victor I mean, Robles, yeah. Yeah, Victor really Robles, player. I just heard. I heard about him just recently. Uh, yeah, man. I, they they look, they could be the favorite. They could be the favorite to come out of the National League. They still have Michael Taylor? Uh, Michael Taylor, that one I do not know. But all I know is their outfield, Juan Soto, Victor Robles, solid right. one-two punch. One, oh uh, yeah. You know what? 
uh, Michael uh, Taylor might be off the team if they got Victor Robles because they both play the same position, center field. Yeah. So he may not even be there. Do they still have Trevor Rosenthal? I don't believe so, actually. No, I don't, I don't believe so. And actually, Michael Taylor went to the Kansas City Royals, so you were right about that. He's no longer on the roster. Okay. So right. with the Nationals – and with them having their pro, like I said, is they have a lot of talent from that 2018 roster still intact. But their con is their bullpen. Now, here's what my prediction is. Your host, Rocco Kelly. I've been giving out what I think the standings are going to be. Uh, go listen to Thursday for the NL Central, Friday for AL Central, and Monday for the AL East. So for this show, I will say in first place, will be the New York Mets. I believe that they have the talent to get the job done. All they need to do is add one or two more arms to that bullpen, and they are strapped. Second place, okay. I say, will be the Atlanta Braves. I think that Atlanta will have enough talent. Understand that they have that core, a lot of really good players in that organization. That starting pitching is going to have to hold their weight. I say they're going to. So I have the Washington Nationals right there in the middle. I have them in third place. They're still going to be a really good roster. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're going to probably be above 500 at the end of the year. But the reason why I don't have them winning that division is because of the fact that their bullpen, it, it's just one of the weakest in MLB. Like, I don't really see their bullpen – being able to save a lot of games. And that's going to be their Achilles heel. Fourth place, I have the Philadelphia Phillies. You know, that the Phillies are the Phillies. You know, they might finish around 500, maybe a little bit below 500, but I don't see them being a contender this year. And then Miami is fifth on that, on that scale. I mean, they're not going to be absolute terrible, only a 60-game win, but I don't see them contending for a championship. And because people are going to ask this question, I have the Mets and the Braves coming out of the division, going into the playoffs. Washington are just barely going to miss. That's what I have the Washington Nationals. Andre, what's your reaction? That's an interesting <laughs> That's an interesting. So you got the Mets, Braves, and Nationals, one, two, three, and I've got it the other way. I've got the Nationals, one, the Braves, two, the Mets, three. Um, interesting. We'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll have to, get, we'll have to uh, keep an eye on it during the year so, so, we can, so we can talk stuff, you know, talk stuff about each other's predictions and what's going on and things of that nature. Can't wait. All right. And uh, now before we get to the end of the show, we have a couple minutes left. I will ask you, because I've asked everyone who's listening to the show, who's either called in or has appeared as a guest, who do you have going to the World Series this year and why? What two teams do you got going? Go. All right. The two teams I have going to the World Series is going to be the L.A. Dodgers, and the New York Yankees. That would make everybody happy. L.A., New York, two biggest markets. I mean, according to odds makers, they are the two odds-on favorites right now. So a lot of people would agree with you. Good. Good. I want to see it. I want to see the Dodgers and the Yankees. And for the people who just asked, on Friday – you're going to have to tune in because I'm going to do the whole rundown of MLB. So stay tuned to Sports Angle on Friday, and I will give you who I think it's going to be. And, Andre, before I let you go, before we get to the end of the show, I want you to shout out, you know, the Rise of Family. Tell everybody where they can find it and what is it. Before I do that, I just want to say that the Yankees-Dodgers rivalry is 8-8 eight and eight right now. They both have eight wins against each other. Mm -hmm. um, got to see that the Yankees won the last one. Um, it would be nice to see that they've been arrived. They have not met in the World Series since 1981, by the way. Yep. 
those two things. So it would be nice to see. Now, with that being said, you know what it is. Continue to continue to support the sports angle. Shout out to the Rise Up family. You know what what we do around here. Rocco Kelly knows knows very well. Um, unity and community is what we about. We about helping folks. Uh, we about promoting positivity in the most positive uh, way that we can. Um, and if you want to find us, you can find us on Facebook at the Rise Up Family page. Um, on Facebook or Rise Up Family Sports Network, you can um, you can find us uh, on the On Point Network where we have shows on the On Point Network. Um, you also can find us on www.riseupfamilyforlife, uh, the number four, uh, for life.com. Um, just support. 2021 is super important to support, all right? So if you want to get a sports angle on things, continue to watch Rocco Kelly and support the Rise Up Family. And for everybody who wants the information about the sports angle, subscribe to the YouTube channel right here. Click that link right down below. Go to our Facebook page at the Sports Angle Radio. Like the page. You'll get all the updates on the show. And go to our website, thesportsangle.com. You'll get our live streams. You'll check out our audio. Check out our video. We have blogs. There's going to be an article written tomorrow. So definitely go check that out. At the sportsangle.com. I'm your host, Rocco Kelly. Go on. Go on.